Amber reports from from Sunnyside Primary School in Glasgow and today I have a guest ranger from the RSPB and is going to tell us some facts about the amazing Hen Harriers. Later on our own sky dancer Kayleigh is going to be reporting from Northern Scotland about a case where a young bird is sadly went missing. Sunnyside Primary School had the opportunity to name this young bird. This young bird was named Thistle. Now on to you Aaron. Thank you Amber. Hello, this is Aaron from the RSPB and today I'm going to give you some information on Hen Harriers. Hen harriers are very intelligent birds. The males are white with black tipped wings and the females are brown. The females also have to build their nests on the ground instead of the trees so they can be camouflaged. The females also have to fly up and catch the food mid-air from the male so the predators get misled and cannot find their nest. Thank you, Erin. Unfortunately, as our next reporter shows, these scales don't work on our hen harriers and protect them from all predators. No. On to Kayleigh in Northern Scotland. Hi, this is Kayleigh reporting live from Northern Scotland. This is a place that this has disappeared. This was a young tagged hen harrier from the RSPB, and one sadly one day she went missing. Sunnyside of Woods an investigation into her disappearance. That's all for me. Back to Amber. Thank you, Kayleigh. morning. Good morning and thank you very much to Sunnyside School for that brilliant breaking news story. Excellent stuff. Yeah. Welcome to Sky Dancer Day 2021. Sky mm. Dancer Day 2021 is a Hen Harrier action initiative with plenty of supporting partners and individuals who we're going to be meeting throughout the course of the approximately next 90 minutes. We've got a flexible schedule. We're mm -hmm. aiming for around aiming 90. About if we don't minutes, waffle too much. We'll try not to waffle. We'll try you not know to what waffle. We're like. we'll, we'll, we'll try and get through. <laughs> but the most important thing is we've got lots of fantastic mm. content this morning, some really exciting stuff, some exciting news about Hen Harriers, some bad news. I'm afraid there's always bad news when it comes to Hen yeah. Harriers at this point in time. The whole point of the day is to try and put as much of that bad news behind us as we can so we're going to be telling you a bit about the birds and uh, all the initiatives that are out there to protect them as well and also the way that they influence people's lives and there's some really quite emotional things coming up we watched all of the uh, little clips that we got last night and i would say i was really touched by some yeah, of them some people really some individuals out there doing some really great things a couple of live interviews as live well live interviews yeah we're joined by olivia blake mp a bit later on in our broadcast uh, she's the species champion for hen harrier as well and she's really keen to get her teeth into that task and she'll be telling us more about it jill lewis jill lewis we'll be back jill lewis is of course the fantastic author of sky dancer all about hen harrier so we'll be chatting to her a little bit about some competitions she's got running and how you can get involved as well so we're really looking forward to that it's a big celebration today really we'll be talking about some serious issues of course when it comes to rapid persecution but it is mainly a celebration and we can't wait to get going yeah and hen harrier action have been working really hard to do something that we've all been craving for a long time and that is to get a live nest cam on a hen harrier's we've been, nest we've been dreaming of this for we've a all been very talking about long it time for, for ages for a yeah. long time we, we were fantasizing ages ago uh don't we Paul Morton, you and I about yeah. getting a, a big screen. Yolo then Yolo. took on the initiative as well, and you know was trying to get it moving. We've all tried to get it moving, but it looks, I have to say, it might be like Hen Harrier Action have finally pulled it off, and we've got some breaking news about that coming up a bit later on. We're going to be some, looking at some fantastic images of Hen Harriers. I've mm. got to say, if they're a bird that you don't know terribly well, then there are some stunning, stunning sequences. You'll get some, to know them very yeah, well over yeah. the course of this ninety minutes. That's yeah, for sure. That's really good. Uh, we'll be talking about some of the progress that we've made. There is a limited ban 
on the burning now in place when it comes to muir burn. So this is the burning of our uplands to promote fresh heather growth to feed enormous populations of red grouse. So we'll be coming on to that a bit later on. Um, there's also obviously a move towards licensing of driven grouse uh, moors in Scotland, which again is a, a move in the right direction, we hope, if and when that comes in and it's enforced, uh, of course. Um, very sadly, whatever we're doing at the moment, we have to reconcile the fact that there's still a very long way to go. Um, most recently, we've lost two more hen harriers that were being satellite tagged, Yarrow and Taras. Um, and Raptor Persecution UK, our good friend Ruth Tingay, has point, been pointing out quite uh, fervently this week that since 2018, we've lost 53 satellite tagged hen harriers under suspicious circumstances. And bear in mind that only a tiny, tiny part of our hen harrier population is satellite tagged. So if we are losing 53 since 2018, how many others are we losing that aren't satellite tagged that we simply don't and can't know about? It's really it's the tip to... of the iceberg, which is the frightening thing. We've got no idea how big that iceberg truly is. Yeah. Also recently, I mean, we have to draw attention to it, but we're not going to dwell solely on the negative today. Today is a celebration of hen harriers and our successes and the tremendous work that's being done to look after these birds all over the UK. But we can't escape the fact that many people set their alarm clocks and get out and, you know, and get on with this work because we are facing all sorts of problems. What about the osprey's nest being cut down? <sighs> You know, when we woke up to that news in, in Wales of this yeah. osprey nest being cut down with a chainsaw during the night, I mean, I think it just broke the nation's heart, didn't it? It's just all this effort and conservation that goes into protecting these animals and um, something like that happens. Well, so do you just... know what? Nothing much gets to me, to be quite honest with you. I mean, I just sort of dig rigorously mm. try and deal with the onslaught of, of, of horror stories, this one after another after another. Um, but I, I, I don't know, I just felt for a moment in time, I felt really disempowered by that. I just sort of thought, you know, so many people for so long have been working so hard to protect ospreys in, in the UK, um, you know, and continue to do so. And then to fly in the face of all of that, you know, hard work and the struggles that the birds face during their migration and everything else and someone just gets a chainsaw and cuts it down it just makes you think what on it what more can we do well what we can do is what we're doing now we, we pick ourselves up and we carry on because we are moving in the right direction and all of that hard work that everyone puts in will at some point pay off that's what yeah, it's all about it is paying off yeah. but i think we should start off with a bit of a celebration and as chris said if you don't know hen harriers yet you definitely will. And this clip is just a wonderful way to do it. Now, Lauren Cook last year won the Young Presenter Challenge. And in August, I actually got the opportunity to interview That was Lauren. with Hen Harrier Day last August. That was August, with Hen Harrier Day last <clears throat> August. And it, she's so, so fantastic. She did, makes the most beautiful illustrations about wildlife. Um, and she did the most amazing film for us last year. This year, she's done it again yeah and it is honestly is the most extraordinary film very beautiful so if you don't know hen harriers here is a clip from lauren cook about the life cycle of this fantastic bird hidden in the moorlands is a rare ghostly silver figure with bright yellow eyes the hen harrier At the beginning of spring, he launches from the heather in a somersaulting and tumbling dance. If this sky dancer is lucky, his display will impress a female and they will couple up to breed. They build a nest amongst the long heather and grass, on which the female can lay between three to five eggs. The team works together as she incubates their eggs and he hunts to feed them both. After a month, the chicks hatch and are born defenceless with a bit of downy fuzz, relying on their parents to feed and protect them. By early July, the chicks begin to fly the nest, but remain reliant on their parents for a few more weeks. The juveniles then begin to spread out, males finding new territories as far as France, Spain and Portugal spending the winter in lowland heaths, marshes and farmland. Sadly, not all of the chicks will survive to adulthood and are in danger of being illegally killed once they leave the nest. 
If they're lucky, two springs later, having grown their silvery plumage, the new sky dancers will take to the upland moors and the cycle begins again. How long it takes Lauren to do that? I have got no oh, yeah. idea. The process is just fantastic. The illustrations are beautiful. The animations, how the birds move around, and I mean, it's just like I, know, what I, I, I quite like the sort of like you know, forgive me, Lauren, but the sort of messiness when you see her hands coming in, because it makes yeah. it so much more real. Yeah, it's just moving. And the little shot at the end where you can see how she's doing it on the table there. So clever. It was really, really good. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was absolutely superb. Yeah. I've got to tell you, me I thought too. it was absolutely superb. Thank you. Thank you so much for putting that together for us, Lauren. Now, if you would mm -hmm. like to see that again and I imagine many people will I certainly be watching it many many times again uh, and also Lauren's entry for last year it all are available on this YouTube channel so you can go and find the links there you can also see the link to where I interviewed Lauren in August last year now if you'd like to follow her on her social media platforms her Twitter handle is at Lauren SJ Cook now all the Twitter handles and information for everyone that we're talking to today will be available in the chat stream so keep an eye there and you'll get lots more people to follow on Twitter and social media to keep you informed and updated. Now we think of the hen harrier these days, certainly in the UK, as a bird of upland areas. They are up on those moorlands. Um, very many of those moorlands obviously used for driven grouse shooting. Uh, they're not necessarily a bird of upland moorland, it's simply that they've been driven there. They were ruthlessly persecuted throughout the uh, 1800s and sadly still ruthlessly persecuted today. But in other parts of Europe, they nest in a wide range of habitats. They were frequent here, even in the south of England. And up until relatively recently, I was spending some time living in France. And we always had hen harrier on the garden list. And in that part of France, in, if you've got a, a rural property, that's not an unusual bird because they're nesting in hedgerows and in, and, and in fields there. So they're not necessarily a, a bird of our uplands it's not something that is prescribed and they could easily adapt to nesting in other parts of the, the UK and other habitats if only their numbers were allowed to grow sufficiently now we're going to be taking a look at a film now uh, by uh, with featuring Jenny Shelton from the RSPB who's looking at these upland areas uh, in a wider context not just in terms of hen harriers but in terms of all of the other species which do live in these upland areas and again some of those species now we've begun to think of as upland birds, things like the curlew. That's simply not the case. Curlews were probably at their most numerous in our wet meadows. Mm -hmm. As we know, we've lost so many of our, what's oh. the stat now? I forget, 90% oh, since 90, the 1930s. I think, it's over. I think it's 93, I think. 93% of our wet meadows have disappeared since the 1930s. Many, of course, since the, um, well, so many in, in, in our lifetime. Mm. Um, so they've been driven into these habitats. It's a last, well, I was going to say it was a last refuge, but uh, obviously for some species, mm. it's far from a refuge. It's a, not the right place we want to, to see. Um, so Jenny Shaw from the RSPB is going to tell us a little bit that, about, sadly, about some of the destructive management that we see in these habitats, but also um, issue a pre- we are fortunate in the UK that we can have access to many parts of our uplands. They're either in national parks or there are obviously footpaths, footpaths and um, roads that crisscross yeah. them. A lot of people do go there for recreational purposes, bird watching uh, uh, amongst Hiking, them. Yeah. yeah, so you can um, you can keep your eyes open and keep an eye on what's going on. So to tell us a little bit more about that is Jenny Shelton from the RSPB. Hi, I'm Jenny Shelton and this is the RSPB's headquarters in Sandy where fantastic work is being done to restore this heathland habitat to benefit a range of wildlife species. Now this is lowland heath but there's no reason that this can't be the same in the uplands. We've all been for walks in places like the Peak District or the North York Moors and seen these vast heather wastelands as far as the eye can see and we think this is perfectly normal, but it's not. These are not natural habitats. These are artificially cultivated 
for grouse shooting. But just imagine a walk on the moors where there were streams and broadleaved woodland as well as scrub and heather. And you were almost guaranteed to see birds of prey, mountain hares, golden eagles even. Now wouldn't that be fantastic? These are just some of the species that we should expect to see out on the moors. Probably the most evocative and haunting moorland sound is the undulating call of the curlew, Britain's largest wader. The UK population of curlew is incredibly important. We host around a quarter of the global population, but still they are declining fast in the UK and need urgent help. Dumpy, skulking, short legs, round looking. Hey, if I were a snipe, might take umbrage to some of those descriptions, except for the fact they are pretty accurate. Snipe are pleasingly plump. They have an incredibly sensitive bill which they use for probing around in the soft earth looking for invertebrates. Sometimes known as a mountain blackbird, ring oozles have those distinctive white bibs and if you see them close enough you might notice their feathers have an almost scaly appearance. The diamond-shaped tail and the real heavy set beak marks out the raven from all other corvids. Listen for their throaty crunk crunk. Merlins, these diminutive falcons are quite like kestrels in appearance and enjoy a good feed on smaller birds and mammals. Pairs often hunt together. Now there's no reason at all why we shouldn't see golden eagles in North Yorkshire or the Lake District. Unfortunately though, these magnificent birds continue to be deliberately poisoned and trapped and just aren't able to expand their range. And that's just the birds. Moors should be teeming with wildlife like mountain hares, stoats and weasels, maybe even beavers. We all want to see these species reclaim the uplands and that could be achieved through different management practices. Less intensive grazing, less intensive burning and the creation of a mosaic of woodland, scrub and open habitats. We're losing wildlife at an alarming rate and this is only going to get worse unless we see meaningful change. To me, more wildlife on our moorlands can only be a good thing. Thanks so much, Jenny, for that. I mean, yeah, all right. that amazing wildlife that has so much potential. That's the word here, isn't it? It's potential. Yeah. There's a lot of solutions. There's a lot of opportunity that is there. It's just making it happen, isn't it? Making it happen. And that means uh, changing people's minds to, mm. so that they can change their practices. And of course, the human species, as I always say, is intelligent, adaptable, resourceful. It's a pretty incredible organism, really. But the one thing it's not very good at is changing its mind and We're certainly reluctant. changing its mind quickly. And there are some quite uh, st stuck in the mud ideas that are still continuing out there. We'll be touching on some of those a bit later on, of course. But what Jenny revealed there is that this habitat can, under the right systems of management and care, be incredibly productive. And she's equally right when she says that we should, we should harbour a human right, a quality of life right, so that all of us can enjoy a healthy, productive upland ecosystem. There's no doubt yeah. about that at all. Um, Jenny Shelton, again, as Megan said, all of the details will be in the chat room, but if you want to follow her on Twitter, she's at Jenny Shelton Cam. Jenny Shelton Cam. Jan Shelton is spelled uh, S H E L T O N Cam. Um, and also, the one other thing to mention is that if you are out and about on those moorlands mm -hmm. looking for those snipe and all of those other fantastic birds that are up there, um, you can keep your eyes peeled for hen harriers. And the RSPB have a hen harrier reporting line, and that's hen harriers at rspb.org.uk. Hen harriers at rspb.org.uk. Every record counts. If we know where the birds are, we will then know where they're not. And where they're not, we should be concerned. Yeah. Um, so, do if you are out and about 
about, particularly as uh, you know, lockdown eases and more people will be yeah. taking to the countryside. Staycationing, I imagine, Staycation. this year. Um, uh, do send all of those reports into the RSPB. We have to protect them as well, monitor and protection as yeah. well. We know where they are, we can keep an eye on them. Which yeah. is, uh, we need important. data. Without data, we can't do effective co conservation of any kind. And you can generate that data with your citizen science work. Now, I mentioned at the top of the programme a really exciting project that Hen Harrier Action have been up to. And it's that is one. finally, finally, um, you know, going through the trial and tribulation of setting up a camera to get a, a live view from a hen harrier's nest. Now, this is, uh, we think, a brilliant initiative because this will allow more people to engage with these brilliant birds mm -hmm. in close up, just like we do on our watches. Yeah, you know? it just gives you an intimate view of these birds that otherwise you would never in a million years get to see. No. You know, the intricates of the behavior, you get to know, you know, the chicks as they're being reared, as individuals, you get to see different kind of traits in them. You get to know them. And once you get to know an animal, then people feel more of an affinity to it. So I think it's such a fantastic project, isn't it? To, if you don't know what a hen harrier is, hopefully with this live streaming, yeah. more people will be aware of what they are and exactly how special they are. But it's not easy, as we know from the watches, you know, putting cameras, remote cameras mm. on nest is a tricky business on yes. several accounts. Firstly, getting access to mm. them can be tricky. The, the technical side of it is always going to be challenging. Weather. And, and yeah, weather. And, and of course, the birds themselves, because they're sensitive, protective species, and therefore we can't take any risk. However, I can tell you that uh, Andrea Goddard has procured some equipment and has got a license to install it. Now, this year, the hen harrier breeding season is a little late, varies from year to year, of course. And they're working with the one and only Brian Etheridge, who is a, a great uh, hen harrier uh, man of note when it comes mm -hmm. to hen harriers and his knowledge. And, and they're working with him, who's uh, he's advising them. And, and at this stage, he is rightly pointing out that, you know, because they're later in the season, uh, at this point um, we can't risk disturbing them they are very sensitive and, and, and we therefore we've had to postpone putting the camera in uh, at this point in time but uh, here is uh, Andrea now we've got a short film that she's made um, about this process and the project so let's have a look at a little look at that before we give you some breaking news Hello and welcome to the Scottish Highlands and its very temperamental spring weather. This year Hen Harry Action have not only been working hard behind the scenes to bring you Skydance Day but also to bring you something else very special indeed, a Hen Harrier Nest Cam. This will afford us live and intimate views from a Hen Harrier Nest never seen online from the UK before. Now alas the technology isn't quite there yet to be able to constantly live stream footage from such a remote location. But we will be able to record and live stream small sections of specific moments such as the eggs hatching or chicks being fed which which will be very exciting indeed the inspiration for this project came from hearing yolo williams's impassioned speeches at previous hen harrier days where he spoke about uh, projecting live hen harrier nest footage into city centers up and down the uk to increase awareness of their plight now whilst this is not quite the same thing it will achieve similar objectives and also raise the public appreciation of this lovely but much persecuted bird. So Yolo, this one's for you. So in terms of camera equipment, I did initially intend to use an old CCTV camera setup that was left up a tree from a red kite monitoring project that finished years ago. Um, here's some photos of us taking that equipment down. Um, it soon became clear that this um, equipment was far too bulky and heavy and indiscreet to be putting up at a, such a sensitive nest as a hen harrier, um, especially where it might be seen on a hillside. Um, so we bought some new kits. So here's the pictures of the new kit. And compare and contrast the difference between the new kit and the old and marvel at just how far technology has come along in the last 10 years or so. And so when can we expect to put the camera in? Well, hen harriers are extremely sensitive to disturbance and that's why we've got a special license to approach and to film at the nest. There is a very high chance that she will abandon the eggs if she's not laid the full clutch yet and, she, and begun to incubate. So we're going to have to watch them very carefully indeed to, to ensure she is actually incubating the eggs. I was just up there yesterday watching the male and the female adding nesting material so we don't think she's yet begun to lay but hopefully she will very soon. Um, so fingers crossed. In about a week's time, we'll have live footage coming to you from the nest with her sitting on eggs and all will be well.
Interestingly, it appears that our male is a satellite tagged bird that hatched a mere 200 metres from this nest back in 2019. It isn't very often that hen harriers um, that are satellite tagged reach breeding age, so this makes this boy very special, especially as his life is very well documented and his life has come full circle. So keep watching the Hen Harrier Day social media channels for the first um, nest cam footage and hopefully we'll get some fantastic insight into the comings and goings of a Hen Harrier nest. A real treat and opportunity indeed. Oh, Let's have a little listen. We are back. We're Hello, back. we lost a quick, quick technical glitch. Lost sound for a few seconds, but hopefully everyone is hearing us now. Well, so. I don't know what I, people have heard that we've said. I don't know. Do we have to say it all over again? I don't, I'm not sure. Probably not. Should we just no, get crazy right. it? What we were saying is it's highly technically challenging. Hopefully within a week, that camera could be up and running. Yep. And it's leaving us working on Spring Watch with a real challenge. Because <laughs> somehow or other, we've got to come up with a live camera, which is going to be as exciting yeah. as uh, as a, a live stream from a hen It's going to be tricky. Gonna and be then tricky. lastly, of course, we were saluting all of the members of that team yes. who are out there in the field working really hard to turn this into a reality. And finally, if you'd like to follow Andrea on Twitter, you can. Andrea H. Goddard, double D in Goddard. Um, and you can follow her on Twitter there. Mm. Anyway. Now, you might remember throughout the course of last year, and particularly for Hen Harrier Day in August last year, we were talking about the Langham Moor Community Buyout. Now, this was a very, very exciting initiative, one which we were just all watching intently as things unfolded. It's a community that come that came together to buy what was formerly a very famous ground small. It's a huge, huge area of land. The community came together to raise funds to buy it for ecological restoration. And we're really pleased to say that they have succeeded and they are doing some amazing work. So far, they've got 5,200 acres, yeah. which is pretty good for rewilding. It's a big area. It's a huge area. And they're working on getting more land as well. Now, I don't want to say too much about it because I'm very excited that we have a fantastic film. So we've got Stuart Spray is uh, coming to tell us a little bit about who's involved with the achievements and the hopes for the future. So take it away, Stuart. This area is a designated area in SPA, which is the European Directive, uh, a special protection area for hen harriers. 
and also an SSI, a site of special scientific interest. Last year there were six pairs of breeding harriers. We'd fledged 16 chicks. This year there are three potential pairs on ter territory at the moment. We're in Taras Valley now and last year we had one of the chicks sadly tugged and named her Taras. We followed her all winter and unfortunately she disappeared in late February in suspicious circumstances, let's just let's say, uh, in Northern Mon. Initially the plan was to go for the larger area, which would have cost over six million. But um, by July we were sort of realising we weren't going to perhaps make that amount of money, but there was a lot of money coming in through the crowdfunder. The last week was absolutely amazing, watching the numbers you know, mount up day by day, hour by hour. It was, it was a very exciting period. Mm -hmm. And we have to thank everybody who helped with the publicity and who helped, you know, retweet things or fire, you know, send off the, their Facebook posts about the, the project, you know, the proposal, because it, it definitely helps a lot to get the word out there. And all kinds of people supported that, so that's tremendous. We had a tiny little school in Glasgow called Sunnyside, and they're very environmentally conscious, and they did a sponsored hop, skip and jump uh, I think the sum they raised was about £200, but it doesn't really matter. It's what was behind it. Their efforts were every bit as valuable as the, the big contributions, because they came from the heart. Yeah, and of course, Hen Harrier Day last year raised £10,000 for us, so that was fantastic. So thank you to everybody who helped contribute to that. That was amazing. It feels incredible to, to be almost a year on from, from last year's Hen Harrier Day um, and in that year there's been a, an almost life-changing experience for, for people here um, at Langham and um, you know, we, we reached this incredible funding goal to be able to create the Taras Valley Nature Reserve. The actual transfer of the, the, the land had to be completed by the end of March and when we got there uh, just in time. Uh, again, we've done that a lot throughout this, this process, um, but yes, yeah, so at the end of March the, the land was, was handed over to, to the Langham Initiative, the charity here, um, and, and yeah, we're now, this is us, it's, it's community owned land. We had a lovely little celebration on the moor and one of our, one of our members actually made a cake with a hen harrier on it. <laughs> it was, an, and she, she had a special t-shirt as well, so it was fantastic. It was a wonderful feeling that this is now Ur Moor. <laughs> and one of the really exciting things about the future of this site is the opportunity to demonstrate a mosaic of habitats working well together. Um, we have a nice plateau of open heather moorland, which is really important for the hen harriers here. But with that, there's also river habitat. Uh, we're standing in amongst the regeneration of ancient woodland. Um, we're also looking at creating native woodland as well, new native woodland. Um, and what we want to be able to show is that those habitats can um, have, have boundaries that merge, that have um, border and marginal species that can benefit from that, that we can create wetlands, that we can um, block the dams for, for, from drain peatland and re-wet areas to help waders. Um, there's, just, there's, there's so much that can be done here. I guess the, the last thing I would say is that from a personal point of view in the journey, that it's been for myself from, from two years ago of uh, you know, a group of community members coming together to think, could we create a nature reserve on, on this area of land that means so much to people both environmentally and culturally, locally. Um, to, to where we are now, and in that time I've become a father as well, and, and I think of, of what we've done here and for our children and for, for the future, and I hope what it does in this really hard time that everyone's had, this devastating time with the pandemic, that it is a little bit of hope and it's a little bit of we're not helpless to our, our circumstance and we can change the, that as well. Such a fantastic 
initiative i love it when communities come together for conservation and this is done on such a huge scale you know the benefits for wildlife and people in those areas is just going to be phenomenal i cannot wait to visit langham you know i loved i loved watching all of those people and Mm. that you could sense their you know their sort of pride as it were yeah in their achievement and also the opportunities you say that it's going to afford them and you know more importantly their children and their grandchildren um and and just made me think you know if they've done it Right. If that community yeah. have come up with that much money to get that that piece of land, communities all over the country could be doing that. We could all do it. You know, we could basically, yeah. you know, get involved in a community land grab. Oh, we're like you know, a community land grab. A community land grab. Land before, grab. Before, you know, developers get it or it's lost to intensive agriculture or it goes under, mm-hmm. you know, um, vanity projects like ludicrous hs2 or something like that you Steam know park or something you know why not you know think about that if if that community of people in langham mm. can pull off a, a you know a, a project like that then other communities should emulate that yeah it, it shows that there's so much power when people come together with a shared passion a shared interest yeah for for wildlife and for any reason you know it, it's going to benefit the economy which is really important, of course, and it benefits so much else. You know, it's safeguarding ultimately everyone's future, isn't yeah. it? And it's um, you, to see people come together like that is just so inspiring. So um, yeah, thank you to everyone. Are they really them. happy as well? Oh, they're such you know a good group of people. Sometimes they're the lovely. bottom line is just that you know people making, being having the power to make themselves happy like that is something that we should yeah. salute and applaud. And it's there. Come on, communities, get yeah. together. Think Invite big, them. think well, big. That was really brave. Yeah. I mean, that's millions of pounds they had to get. That's yeah. a, that is a brave And they've project. done an amazing thing. So, yeah, put letters in your neighbour's post box, you know, maybe knock a door. If you can have six people in your garden, socially distanced, of course, have a little chat about it and um, get together. Get it growing. Get together, get it growing. And you can, of course, find out about all of the Lang and Moore initiatives over on their social media platforms, which are, again, going to be posted in the chat too. So as that nature reserve comes to I've only to been life, there once. I've been there once when they were doing the, you know, because yeah. it was an area that was quite interesting intensively studied and I went up there on just for one very wet day I have to say to look at some um, diversionary feeding that was being done at the time mm-hmm. but so I've only been there once but I certainly want to look at, looking forward yeah. to going back there now to you know yeah, you know when it's safe to do so literally just or metaphorically shake the hands of those people who pu- pulled that off because yeah. that was brilliant hats off to them literally absolutely Fantastic. brilliant um of course, restoring that habitat is going to take a, a long time. You can't rush nature. It goes at its own pace. Sometimes, actually, it can be quite it quick. It can be fast. It can be quick. It's but when it comes to it trees is. and things yeah, like that, you know, that's, trees are so slow. I just they wish to get a yeah, move no. on. Well, I planted you know. trees. Yeah, I just wish they'd get a move on. They're not mature yet. Loitering around like this. You know, come yeah. on. Come on. I want a bit of maturity. Um, but you're joking aside, you, um, you can't rush nature. So many of these sorts of projects, certainly those that involve rewilding, we have to think long term. Yes. Yeah. Kengorms Connect in Scotland is a 200 year project. That's their vision. It's over 200 years. And, and that's relatively short term in the grand scheme of trees. You're right. You know, we, you know, thousand years, you know. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. But those projects, you know, uh, need to work really. I mean, you can rewild your garden with a rewilding here, really. But, yes, you know, sprinkling very well. it will, you know, this our garden isn't big enough to really support a sustainable population of anything other than a few, I don't know, what really, well, sort of bryophytes or something. If you if you want to support sustainable populations of animals and have a balanced ecology, you need a big area. And uh, there's nothing bigger than um, than Scotland, the whole of Scotland. Now, there are a number of rewilding projects running in Scotland already, but I'm pleased to say that the Scottish Rewilding Alliance has come together with a multitude of partners to think about rewilding a nation. They want yes. to be the first rewilded nation on Earth, which is, again, a brilliant idea. That's fantastic. With all sorts of benefits. And we're very pleased to say that the Scottish Rewilding Alliance have allowed us to use a, a short animation, which explains, again, their very exciting vision. So take a look at this. Scotland, a land of majestic vistas and thrilling wildlife where the clouds scud fast and the skies light up like magic, where the wee bit glen meets the mighty ben, and wait, look around, our landscapes are grand, but there's more to this picture than meets the eye. Why is so much of our land so bare? Where's the life that was once there? A mighty medley of creatures once filled Scotland's woodlands, wetlands, and seas. Life hummed and thrummed, 
weaved and wallowed, butted and bellowed. And people were part of it all, in tune with extraordinary rhythms of life. But over time, we changed. We fell out of step with those precious beats, pushing creatures to extinction and squandering our seas and soils. Our land today is emptier, poorer, our wildlife fragmented, muted. But tomorrow can be different. We can reconnect with the rhythms and help nature flourish. We call it rewilding. It turns up the volume on nature, allowing it to grow and flow, bloom and boom. Filling our landscapes with a riot of colour and song, the great web of life that supports our health and well-being. Rewilding gives us the chance to create a future where the lynx can roam and rivers run wild, where birds fly free and woodlands thrive, where we move in tune with those magnificent beats and the wonder of life bursts back to our land and seas. You need a big idea to make a big difference. And I think that in the past, we've had ideas that have been too little and they've made too little difference. There have been too few of them, too far apart. Now is the time to really think big. And I think it, it does require some bravery to do that. Yeah. But they're doing great things that, you know, the Scottish Rewilding Alliance have got uh, more than 20 partners. And it's, uh, I'm going to read them all out, actually, because I think they all deserve credit. So you've got the Southern Uplands Partnership, Reforesting Scotland, Mountaineering Scotland, the Woodland Trust Scotland, Borders Forest Trust, Scotland the Big Picture, Trees for Life, Rewilding Britain, Allerdale Wilderness Reserve, Cromac, the, the uh, Bun, Bunlow Estate, RSPB Scotland, Open Seas, Conservation Capital, Scottish Wild Beaver Group, Scottish Raptor Study Group, the European Nature Trust, Scottish Badgers, Highland Boundary, Argati Red Tights, Kipchoan Estate, and the Ramblers uh, Scott. Those people have come together in what we hope will be an effective partnership to basically change people's minds mm -hmm. so that we can change their practices and make not just Scotland, of course, because if it works in Scotland, yeah. others will, 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 you know, will follow in behind them. Yeah. But there's a lot of good progress taking place in Scotland, actually, um, perhaps more so in England, particularly when it comes to, you know, looking after our uh, raptors and uplands. Now, we've banned the, you know, wholesale culling of mountain hares. That's, that's one significant bit of progress. Yes. There's licensing, as we mentioned at the top, you know, there's a chance that licensing will be introduced on grouse moors so that we can monitor the activities on those grouse moors properly. And if they're improper activities, we can perhaps take away those licenses. Mm -hmm. This has still got some time to run, but it's on the table in Scotland and it's not on the table here in, in England. So Scotland are in many ways leading the way and Scottish Rewilding Alliance is something you should definitely check out. Of course, the website is really good. Lots of uh, um, things to see there. And that's rewild.scot. Rewild.scot, you'll find it there. Um, and then uh, other information is available on rewildingbritain.org.uk. We've got an extensive website there. And if you really want to look into the future, uh, a future which we hope is not too far away, yep. then I have to say, Rewilding Europe. Go to the Rewilding Europe website uh, because really it's inspirational, mm -hmm. the work that they are doing in eight places across Europe, building new landscapes, building that biodiversity, building human communities that have got resilience, um, investing in them in intelligent ways. It, it's, it's really, really exciting. And, and I hate to say it, if they can do it, then we should be able to do it too. So take a look at all yeah. of those websites. As I say, We Wild Scott, We Wild in Britain, and then if you really want a taste of the future, well, the future we hope is coming, We Wilding Europe. Now, young people are using their voices now more than ever. And every time I see young people standing up for wildlife, I'm so inspired and just, it's just the most amazing thing because they are looking out for the wildlife for their future because when they grow up, they wanna make sure that hen harriers are dancing in those skies too. Now, Sunnyside School in Glasgow, who we featured a few times, they were up at the beginning of the show, they're back again because they've got a very important message to say. Now, it's a fantastic school, I have to say, very much environmentally focused, very into wildlife. And I wish I, I, wish I went to Sunnyside. Yes. I would love to have gone to Sunnyside. You know, it's what a fantastic school. I know. Um, 
so they are a primary school in Glasgow, as I said. Um, the children were very fortunate because in summer of 2019, they were able to name a female hen harrier. They called her Thistle as part of the RSPB's life programme. Imagine that, though. You yeah. get to name your own hen harrier. Just enjoy her. You get to see where she moves around. Satellite tagged, of course. But what an amazing inspiration project for children to get involved in. But sadly, it wasn't quite such a happy ending because this all disappeared under suspicious circumstances. She was last uh, noted, last transmission of Thistle's tag was received on the 12th of October from a grouse moor in East Sutherland. So the chances are, unfortunately, Thistle did disappear and in very distressing circumstances. And uh, the kids at Sunnyside have made a video to talk a little bit about what could have happened to her. Hi, we are the PSAC Pollard Brewers from Sunnyside and we do female hen hatters and they're brown because they nest on the ground and need to camouflage to protect their chicks. We had a female hen harrier called Thistle. Her camouflage didn't help her because she went missing over a grouse moor. Have you seen Thistle? We must protect him, Harry, or just out for the domain. It's special on the temperature where we play. The way some people treat hen harriers is just not fair. Is Vessel hiding somewhere on the stairs? If we could find Vessel, he four would be Mary. Is Vessel hiding in a room with Miss Perry? We couldn't find Thistle, she is still gone. Please help us find her. Thistle, stay strong. Very, very sad news about Thistle and hopefully, you know, less hen harriers will share the same fate of disappearing in suspicious circumstances. But, you know, great job by Sunnyside School for connecting with those hen harriers and bringing more attention onto the plight of this amazing species. Uh, what an incredible group of people. Yeah, it is very imaginative, but like you say, yeah. so equally really sad. We've gone it's a bit one sided. Sad. Look, there's a bit more me than you. I'm going to turn oh, it around. Okay. Let's turn it around. Hold on. There we go. There we go. There, there we are. are. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Okay. That's a bit more equal now. Oh. 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 Now, unfortunately, obviously, the reason that uh, Sunnyside School made that was because this all disappeared under suspicious mm. circumstances, and that fate is a common one when it comes to our hen harriers, and most of those circumstances are associated with the activities on driven grouse moors. Raptor persecution isn't limited to driven grouse moors, we have to accept it uh, does sadly still occur all over the UK, and when it comes to addressing this issue, firstly discovering it, investigating it, trying to prosecute those who are guilty of the crimes the rspb's investigation unit do uh, an amazing job mark they thomas do. yeah, they, yeah they do. mark thomas is fantastic mark thomas and his team yeah. do do really great work but uh, it's only appropriate because we're very keen on uh, getting young people in to do uh, things which they're very capable of doing and very good, yeah. you were saying it's you know it's time now for young people to uh, to lift their voices and use those voices and us old people like me 
60 plus four days, uh, are very keen to offer them a platform to uh, to get involved. So we're really pleased to say that a friend of ours, Indy Green, mm -hmm. has taken on the task of interviewing uh, Mark Thomas from the RSPB's Investigations Unit for a bit of a catch up when it comes to raptor persecution here uh, in the UK. So here is Indy and Mark. Good morning, everyone. My name is Indy and I'm a 15 year old naturalist from Nottinghamshire. And it is my great pleasure today to be speaking with the fantastic Mark Thomas, who's head of the RSPB investigations team, to talk a bit more about the amazing work that him and his team get up to all across the UK. So, Mark, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And can you tell us a little bit about and kind of give us an overview of what Raptor Persecution is? Hi, Indy. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, so, I lead a fantastic team. We've got about 15 staff in the team and we try and tackle the illegal killing of birds of prey. So these amazing birds, peregrines, goshawks, eagles, and these are birds that unfortunately are illegally killed. They are shot, trapped and poisoned. And most often that is in, in link, linked in with land that is used for shooting. So be it driven grouse moors in the uplands or pheasant or partridge shoots in the lowlands. So the team I manage, we're out there every single day trying to detect crimes. We spend a lot of our time on grouse moors in particular. We're walking around, we're looking for the signs of illegal persecutions, be it traps, poisons, um, shooting of birds of prey. We do that across the whole of the UK. And every single year we produce an annual report called Bird Crime, and that details all the incidents that have taken place. What we try and do is detect things gather the evidence and that and that could be using covert methods so cameras hidden cameras to gather evidence and once we've got evidence of a crime that's taken place we will then pass that to the police and we work jointly with them in investigating that matter hopefully to a successful conclusion at court brilliant stuff so why and whereabouts in the uk does this mostly happen okay so incidents occur all the way across the uk but the worst areas the black holes are particularly in the uplands, so places like the Peak District, the Yorkshire Dales, uh, the Cairngorms National Park, the Angus Glens. They're places where driven grouse moors exist, and those places are where some gamekeepers are killing birds of prey. So when we look at the stats, um, around three quarters of all the convictions for people killing birds of prey those people have been linked to shooting within game gamekeepers or land managers. So the problem, we absolutely know where the problem is. It's in hotspot locations where driven grouse moors conflict with birds of prey. And this is where the pressure is put on people to kill birds of prey illegally. So all birds of prey have been protected in the UK for many years. And many of these birds of prey, birds like hen harriers, are, are, are really rare and they're under enormous pressure. So we have an absolute duty to conserve these birds. Absolutely. So you mentioned earlier about that you publish the bird crime report every year, which talks about all the sightings that, and all the records, I suppose, of persecution throughout that past year. So apart from, uh, I suppose, collating the data, you guys do a lot of field work, don't you? Yeah, so we've got um, half of the team, approximately half of the team spend every single day out in the field and we're intelligence led. So what that basically means is information comes in uh, about crimes or about suspicious incidents or about people, and we follow that up on the ground. So we will go to the locations where we have the best intelligence and we'll routinely go there and we'll notice what is happening on the ground. And the aim of that is to try and detect crime. So it may be um, some gamekeepers will use a crow cage trap. So this is about the size of a garden shed it's got an entrance in the top. It works like a lobster pot. So when things go in, they can't get back out. Now, you can use these to control magpies and crows, but these traps can be abused. And if you put carrion or meat in, in the traps, they will attract birds of prey. So if you're using that trap lawfully and a buzzard is in there, you open the door, you let the buzzard go. But we know these traps are abused. So we'll often find traps in locations where we know persecution has happened before. We'll put a camera in and we'll let the camera run for a period of time. When we come back to view it, we'll see what has happened to anything that's been caught in the trap. So um, a number of jobs like this, we've actually filmed gamekeepers come along and actually unlock the trap, go in there and then kill buzzards or other birds of prey that have been caught in the traps. And we've got the evidence. They don't know the camera's there. And that evidence has been crucial in gaining convictions. And people might say, well, why didn't you just let the buzzard go? 
Well, we can't be there every single day, and it's far easier to catch somebody who's killing these birds of prey and stop the person killing them, and that will save many, many, many more birds in the future. Good stuff. And I remember, um, I keep seeing almost every time I log on social media, it's like another case of persecution, but sometimes they're from quite far back. And I think they're still releasing some reports that were from lockdown. And I think lockdown was probably one of the worst times, wasn't it, for the raptor persecution? Yeah, so we, we produce the figures normally in the autumn for the previous year because it takes us a long time to contact all the police forces and to get the conclusions of all these jobs. But but we knew within a week or two of lockdown happening, we knew there was a surge of incidents coming in. So, so there was many, many incidents coming in. They were coming in from all the traditional places where we've had persecution in the past. And we were incredibly busy. The team was stretched. It was really run off its feet during this time. So we had permission to go out because detecting crime is seen as essential. So we worked hand in hand with the police. And whilst reports were coming in, we were also involved in a number of search warrants with the police in North Yorkshire, a couple on grouse moors where buzzards had been shot. So it was a really busy time. So come this autumn, in a few months time, we'll be, we will be releasing the figures from last year. And it already looks like it's going to be a record worst year, uh, particularly in England for birds of prey. And I suppose one of the most effective birds of persecution is the beautiful hen harrier. Now, I know there's quite a high figure of birds that have been missing since I think it's 2018 is the recent figure. What is that number? I think I think the number's current, currently in the top 40s. So we, we fit um, lightweight satellite tags under license, and these tags are fitted to hen harriers, and they enable us to see exactly where the birds are. And when a bird dies, if it dies a natural death, the tag will continue working. We'll be able to go to the location and recover the bird, have the bird looked at by a vet, and we can conclude if it's a natural death. Unfortunately, people, as we know, are killing hen harriers. And if you shoot a hen harry with a tag on, the very last thing you're going to do is leave it there for a researcher to come and find it. So we know a number of these tags have been um, destroyed. So the bird has been shot. The person shooting the bird has then destroyed the tag. And the way we we can tell that the data manifests itself in a way where we have a sudden stop. The tag is working perfectly well. We know where the bird is, the bird is moving, and then suddenly the data just stops. And we know in those incidences, because they are linked to the locations and the locations are driven grouse moors, we know in those in incidents it's highly suspicious. In fact, Natural England did some research, you know, and and there's a real strong correlation with birds disappearing in those circumstances and driven grouse moors. We know who's killing these birds and we know when they're being killed. Yeah, it's as simple as that. And those tags have given you guys, well, everybody such an insight into what's really going on. I suppose they're, they've got to be one of the most useful things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've, we've now been tagging for about seven years. We've tagged over 125 hen harriers. And wow. we're currently writing all the data up for a peer-reviewed paper that's going to, be, going to be coming out soon. And that's going to reveal the fate of those hen harries that have been tagged, you know. And um, it will be another really important piece of science in the jigsaw of telling the story of what is happening to our hen, hen harriers. It's a very rare breeding bird in England. You know, we've got a hand, handful of pairs. And whilst those pairs may produce young, we know from those young being tagged that the survival chances of those are really limited due to persecution. So this is a big problem. Absolutely. So what do you think needs to change in terms of stopping raptor persecution? What do you think needs, what, what areas do you think need to change? Um, several things. So the legislation could be better. Um, the government could take a much stronger, firmer hand with the estates that we know are killing birds of prey. What the RSPB wants is licensing. So each each driven grouse moor has a license to operate. And what that basically means is if any criminal offences in relation to birds or wildlife occur on that estate, the license can be revoked. And, and that would be a very strong deterrent because the people who are orchestrating the killing and telling the gamekeepers to kill birds of prey, if they can't run a driven grouse shoot for several years because of an incident, it will really focus their, their minds. And we, we would probably see a reduction in persecution almost immediately from that. Um, it's, it's highly likely that that could happen in Scotland in the, near, in the near future. The Scottish government are suggesting this is what they're going to do. We've just got to wait for the elections that are coming up in May and see what the outcome of those are. But um, we, we really need licensing. Of course, 
lots of other people are calling for a ban. They want driven grouse shooting to be stopped completely. RSPB itself has reviewed its policy recently, and we are going to be looking at this situation very carefully over the next five years. And if we don't see improvements in these areas, then the RSPB is probably going to get tougher as well. Good stuff. So I'm sure many people watching this, some people might be familiar with rap persecution. This might be the first time some people have heard about it. And I'm sure a lot of people will wonder what can, if anything, can they do to help? Yeah. The public can play an enormous role and they have been doing so. So, you know, thank you very, very much for everything that everyone is doing for us. Um, about 10 to 15 years ago, not many people would know what Raptor persecution was or is or where it occurs. Most people now know, lots of people know. There's been some really big national stories. There's been a, cam a campaign last year to send um, a petition to your MP calling for this to stop. So the main thing that people can do is be the eyes and ears. So when they're out in the countryside, particularly in areas where they know raptors have been killed in the past, be vigilant. And if you do see something, gather evidence. If you've got a camera, take the pictures. If you've got a video, video it. If you come across a dead bird of prey or what you think is a poison bait, you know, get in touch with the police immediately. Ring the RSPB. Let us know what you see. We, we get lots of calls from people who think they're wasting our time, but when they tell us what they've seen, it's just like the final piece of the jigsaw. We've been looking at that location in the past and the information is really, really val valuable. So please continue to report that. The easiest way is to email us, which is crime at rspb.org.uk. Or if an incident is in progress, you ring the police on 999. If you've just seen a buzzard being shot or you found a dead peregrine next to a bait, get on the phone to the police immediately from the location. Good stuff. And do you, do you personally, do you feel positive about the future? Do you think change is coming? How are you kind of inspired with the work that you do that you think change will happen? Yes. I mean, if we, if we look at the timeline, there's been lots of positive change in the very short, short space of time, you know, so we've got the public on our side. It's, it's a very um, emotive, issue um, you know no one wants to see amazing birds like golden eagle being poisoned or shot no one wants to see see that so we have to take a really strong stand lots of people are doing that we've had amazing success from things like hen hen harrier day and then people like chris packham you know spreading the news far far and wide on this issue is great so this is going in one one direction change has to come and i think change will come and i think there's a brighter future for birds of prey at this moment in time, it's not the time to take the foot off the gas, though. We, we have to, you know, call this out when we see it. We've got to keep detecting evidence and, you know, together we can stop raptor persecution. Which is exactly what you're doing. So thank you so much for the incredible work you do. So back to Chris and Megan. Thank you very much, Mark. And also RSPB Birders on Twitter, certainly worth following as well.
And do remember that address that we gave earlier. If you're out and about on the moors, you do see hen harriers, or certainly if you see any suspicious circumstances surrounding those or other species, hen harriers at rspb.org.uk. Hen harriers at rspb.org.uk. I think sound is going in and out a little bit, so sorry if there is any technical difficulties, but we're working on it and we will be right back with sound if we do, if we are lost for a few seconds. But um, anyway, I think we should go on to the next fantastic project. Now, one thing that's incredibly difficult is getting prosecutions for criminal activity. Gathering enough evidence and figuring out who is responsible is, is really tricky. And that's a real big part of the job of the RSPB and that criminal investigation team. It's very, very difficult. Um, but in response to this problem, uh, a couple in, ha um, in Hartoft in North Yorkshire, it's a very kind of rural village, um, made the most amazing mural. And in August, we showed you for Henry Day last year, showed you a video of this mural. I'm really pleased to say that we're back again, Nikki and Simon Johnson, to tell us a little bit of the story about how this mural came to be in this village. We had the germ of an idea last year, uh, come Hen Harrier Day, because we were aware of raptor persecution incidents in North Yorkshire particularly. We've lived here 30 years, we've got 70 plus years of primary teaching between us, and we very much think we live in a decent community. What's very upsetting is when you find out that there are some elements in that decent community who will persecute raptors. Whatever the motivation, whether it be employment, not requirements, but pressures, whether it just be personal profit or whether it becomes enjoyment, we, you know, whatever the motivation is, it's a crime. And a crime is a crime whether you support shooting, you're ambivalent about shooting or you're pro-shooting. And that was the motivation behind this, was a crime is a crime no matter what. This is a depiction of what is and what possibly could be. And that was it, simply. <laughs> we had the idea, we had a little plan. We thought perhaps paint something on an eight by four piece of marine ply. And we had a lot of leftover paint from <laughs> painting the house. We had a big pot of masonry paint and we were ready to go. And then news came through of a, a, a buzzard which had been persecuted in Appleton the Moors and then lo and behold the news came through of the goshawk that was killed in Gothland and that is not far away and at that point we looked at this rather large pot of masonry paint and all the associated pots of various colours and shades and pigments and thought blow it we'll go big so we did yeah. we we planned to do a landscape now neither of us has done anything as large as that before and we're not artists so I took some advice from a friend and said how would you do it he's an artist and he gave us a few pointers and then it was a case of shinning up a ladder drawing <laughs> things and getting going with it we decided to use the 8x4 piece of ply to put the birds on so we drew them Simon bless him cut them all out and got blisters to prove it <laughs> And my friend and I painted them up, varnished them. Then Simon was the one up the ladder with the drill, drilling the wall and mounting them for me last Saturday. So it was a very much a team effort oh. and <laughs> we're very much surprised that it's worked as well as it has. Yeah. But we're happy. It's, you know, it's an important message. Whether or not you're pro, whether you're, not, you're anti, a crime's a crime and that's it, simply. Yeah. It's a beautiful picture anyway, I think, uh, whatever, whatever your opinion, I don't think you could really take offence at, uh, at that at all. I think it's just marvellous. I, I think it's uh, great to see her artistic talents put to great use. <laughs> Thank you. 
absolutely fantastic work there and what a beautiful mural I mean yeah. I would just love to be walking past that every day or drive past that and see that I mean it's a celebration isn't it of what is Could. there or what well should be there yeah it's what should be there and as a constant reminder to protect those animals and hopefully you know young people growing up seeing that mural will have an affinity for those birds and yeah what, what a, a great idea I think you know murals everywhere but, but yeah. that, as they said you know they were living in a community where there are people persecuting raptors yeah so it also exactly. sends out a message to them as well exactly so it serves a reminder doesn't it that you know they are being monitored and, and, it, and they people are want a different birds. world we don't want yeah. a world without hen harriers or, or any no. of those other species not just those that are illegally persecuted as the countless hundreds of thousands millions of other animals which are legally killed on these grouse moors every year foxes stoats weasels yeah. polecats all of the things that are caught in the traps bycatch we've seen merlins we've seen dippers Gross. we've seen pine marks, list we've seen red squirrels endless. again you know I would point dogs you... people's pet dogs and cats know. you know poisoned dogs it's just poisoned. I would point you to the Revive Coalition. If you go to the Revive Coalition's website, you'll see that they've conducted a, a number of surveys looking at the density of traps on grouse moors and the number of animals that have been caught in them. And the figures are quite staggering. A couple of reports that we're looking at there. Uh, you're watching Sky Dancer Day 2021 with Megan McCubbin and me, Chris Packham, uh, put together by Hen Harrier Action. Um, it's on YouTube, obviously, you know that if you're watching it, but the, you'll be able to re watch any parts of this. Mm -hmm. All of the people that we're featuring today, we're putting up their social media tags in the chat, but if you miss them, they're in the body of the program and they'll be accessible elsewhere. Now, I'm really pleased to say now that we're going to be welcoming Olivia Blake, MP, on to our broadcast yeah. this morning. Uh, Olivia is the species champion for hen harriers in the UK. Uh, she's the elected representative of Sheffield Hallam uh, constituency. Uh, she got that, uh, got that position in 2019 and she's been very vocal when it comes to talking about climate issues. And I'm very pleased to say in her inaugural speech in the House of Commons, she raised the issue of driven grouse shooting and its ills. So fit to be a species champion no doubt about that before we speak to her live which we will do in a moment here's a short video introducing olivia and her ideas about this issue my name is olivia blake i'm the member of parliament for sheffield hallam a constituency which borders the edge of the beautiful peak district national park earlier this year i became the hen harrier species champion um, and I'm really excited about working with RSPB to spotlight this amazing species and campaign to protect it. Hen harriers are currently one of the most persecuted birds of prey in Britain. Despite being legally protected, hen harriers that live on moors are instead relentlessly shot and trapped or have their habitats burnt just to create good conditions for grouse shooting. This has to stop and we have to raise awareness about the issues facing our hen harriers. I am currently campaigning in Parliament to strengthen government legislation to clamp down on peatland burning and restore these habitats so our hen harriers are protected and our environment is restored. Excellent stuff mm -hmm. there from uh, Olivia Blake outlining the reasons why she's so keen yeah. to be a species champion for this enigmatic, iconic and also much persecuted species. So I'm very pleased to say that we can join Olivia now from Sheffield, I presume. Good morning, Olivia. Are you there? Yes. Good morning, Chris and Megan. Hello. Can I just say, like, it's been such an enjoyable morning so far. I think it's such a great idea, this, and I'm so pleased to be joining you. Yeah, well, no, thank, well, you, thank you very much. A lot of people worked really, really hard but behind the scenes. Hen Harry Action have brought lots of people together as you've seen to contribute this morning which is their which is their mission because this is uh, not an issue which we want to keep to ourselves in the birding community it is one mm -hmm. that affects us all culturally anyway that's what we're going to talk to you about firstly um sheffield hallam tell us a bit about your constituency because i'm given to understand that despite the fact you've got bits of the city center and bits of the suburb you've also got grouse moors in your constituency yeah so i think you know when people think of sheffield they think of the steel city but um you know and kind of like industry and things like that but actually you know Sheffield Hallam is an amazing constituency because it goes right from the city centre right out into the Peak District and then um, what we call Sheffield's Lakelands a lot of that falls into my constituency and um, so I'm really proud to represent a um, area with such great beauty um, and 
and interesting species so yeah it's a great it's a great place to represent as an MP and I think you know some of these issues are very much hot and live issues around um, you know burning um, and also driven grouse um, shooting as well. The burning issue is obviously we are concerned about the ecological impacts of that, but there's also a quality of life issue for the people who are disconnected from it in any way, shape or form when it comes to air quality. And we know that studies are being done now on the effects of air quality uh, being reduced significantly by burning. So frankly, if you've got grouse moors and the wings in the wrong direction, some of your constituents could be choking on the, uh, on, on the, on the smoke, as it were. Yeah, and there's something quite, you know, you look at the horizon and you can just see this billowing smoke and it you know of course we all know burning wet matter is the worst for kind of particulates and and the bad things about burning anything really so you know that air quality is is going to become an increasing issue i think it's also important to recognize the peat element of this and you know we've got the peatlands are so important to kind of our um not only ecological but also um in the environmental and kind of um, climate crisis that we're facing as well so it's really important that we protect the peak that is underneath a lot of these moors as well um, so you know lots of issues that will impact on people's health and well-being but also the well-being of our planet you mentioned the structure of your constituency there for, as you say from you know it's, it's basically everything from urban to rural. Um, obviously, therefore, you've got very different sort of types of, of people living within your constituency. It must be quite challenging trying to represent all of them, particularly over an issue like this. You might have some people who are on those grass moors saying, well, this is how we make me live our living. We need to burn this. That's just the way it's always been done. And then you've got the people on the edge of the city that are choking on that smoke and saying, well, frankly, we don't want our, our, our children and ourselves exposed to those particulars. It's, yeah. it's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, it is a tough one. And, you know, a lot of people have contacted me about hen harriers in particular but you know I think it's it's um you know the broader issues here um really do divide people um that is difficult to navigate as a, a politician but I think that um there's quite clearly a stack of evidence um about the environmental impact of this burning um, and I think it's my duty um as the as the representative of this area to prioritize people's um health but also the well-being of that our kind of nature as well um so you know there has been challenging conversations had um, a lot of the landowners actually don't use burning anymore um within the area and a lot of the land is actually owned by the local council and is let it out um, and there's some great fantastic projects go, uh, springing up all over the lakelands to try and um you know really help diversity um, and biodiversity uh, to make sure that we are seeing kind of the restoration of this kind of landscape away from just kind of uh, heather, uh, which I think is really important and matters to people locally too. Absolutely. One, one of the things about driven grouse shooting is it's famous for being inordinately expensive. Yes. Uh, we hear tales of people who, you know, who will spend up to £13,000 for a day's shooting. Um, not That's at the upper end of, of that. Um, and as a consequence of that, there are some within the fraternity who oppose it that tend to use sort of, well, what should we say, if not class, economics as, as part of their argument. It's, you know, it's a tiny... This, this is their this, this is their, uh, their their claim. A tiny number of extraordinarily wealthy people are abusing an environment for their own vicarious pleasure, uh, whilst it's not accessible to the others. Um, I'm not entirely sure that I, I always take that line. I think you know it doesn't matter how much money you've got if you're damaging something you didn't ought to be damaging it. But social inequality and balancing that is going to have to be at the root of solving so many of these problems, isn't it? Absolutely, I completely agree with you, Chris. I think that that's such an important point to make around this. And, you know, I think that actually the pandemic has been really good for kind of reconnecting people with our like environment. Um, but absolutely, as you say, too much of it is cut off from people. Um, you know, it's not a natural environment. We know this. It is all about driven grouse uh, more um, shooting um, and it's and it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem as time goes by and you know we've seen far too many of these precious raptors disappear 
Um, and, it, and it's really important that we continue to kind of take all the different issues that affect our uplands into account and make sure that people have free access to them and the enjoyment and fulfillment out of this environment. I think that's just as important as, as the business side of this. I think the business side of this is, um, is, is, is a difficult conversation to have with people who make a lot of money out of this, but I think our priorities have to be elsewhere. We know that the number of instances in terms of rupture persecution has increased during the lockdown and a lot of what's been said is that people have connected with nature throughout the course of lockdown more than ever before. I mean, has there been a change, a shift in those conversations that you're having about the environment within your constituency? Is there something notable that's that's happened throughout the course of the last year? Um, I think, you know, as a casework that comes in and policy p issues that people want to talk about environments one of the biggest things that we get through our door covid was obviously the top one uh, so i think people are becoming much more aware and much more passionate and wanting to protect our like such such an important resource and you know i think people know that the the conditions of our uplands and are in a poor state and a lot more needs to be done to restore and and you know in some places rewild these um, and I think I think that that's really important to people and they're really wanting to see see that change. And I think, you know, it's on me as a politician to kind of be the voice for that and champion that. And I'm I'm really pleased that I've been able to use what little influence I have um, to raise these issues in Parliament. You know, we had a debate about burning in, in Parliament in Westminster Hall, which was very well attended uh, by Yorkshire MPs. But, you know, it's not just persecution that we've seen increase um, in Yorkshire alone. We saw a 20% increase on burning this year, which is a shocking figure, given that this is the same year that they're announcing that they're going to be uh, bringing in a supposed ban, uh, which I, I've been quite critical of because it, it simply will not protect um, the, what it needs to protect uh, from, from that kind of damaging um, practice. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned there your, you know, ability to influence as a politician. I mean, that's what obviously I'll, I'll be brutal. That's what we elect you for. That's your <laughs> that, that's your job. Um, but, you know, Zach Goldsmith promised action over burning. We've now heard from DEFRA that they put out and said, you know, you, you can but you, you know, you can only burn when I think it's that the peaks 40 centimetres below the surface. Um, there is no map. No research has ever been conducted yeah. across the UK mm -hmm. to identify those areas where peat might be 40 centimetres below the surface. It, uh, basically, this is not an effective way at this point in time of being able to regulate burning at all. What, what can you do, Olivia? Um, I mean, can you I, I, I'm asking you about the processes of politics here. You know, what, what can you do? Can you can you go and um, kick Zach? in the shins and tell him to put you know pull his socks up and get this uh, uh, um, as a more effective piece of legislation metaphor well, I'm, I'm actually harm, i don't want you to harm zach's <laughs> no no obviously and you know clearly clearly zach's in the lords but is is kind of taking the lead on some of this but i am actually meeting with um with one of the ministers about this piece of legislation to kind of be a bit critical about what the uh, impact of it will actually be. I mean, clearly we've seen in Scotland, we've discussed it earlier today, um, the kind of measures that they've been taking around licensing. And actually that's probably going to have a much bigger impact on burning uh, than this, this kind of ban, so-called ban, uh, will. Um, and you're absolutely right. The knowledge of natural England of our environment is actually very poor. I'm shocked. And I've been constantly asking questions, um, written questions about this, which I'm sure people will be very interested in some of the answers that we've got. Um, but it's, it's it's just incredible, really, because, you know, I know different groups are saying different levels won't be protected. You know, it's it's kind of like huge percentages of our precious moorlands won't be covered by this. And it's it just seems ridiculous. And it's kind of like this approach just feels half hearted. And it's like they're fulfilling a promise. Um, but without the uh, kind of ability to actually have any impact uh, or any kind of management of it. So I think that really we need to we need to see a much firmer kind of bill coming forward. And um, it's, it's really difficult as well, because they are planning to do this through statutory instrument, which is a more tricky way of us to kind of scrutinise it, which I know is very technical for people, but it does make it more challenging as a politician, which is why I'm, I've reached out directly to the minister to have this discussion. Because um, I think it's really important that those views are heard very loud and clear uh, by government that this just simply won't be enough. Um, and I'll continue to do that and push 
for better action. Um, but yeah, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see licensing come in. Um, I think that that would be, that would be definitely be a positive step. Um, but, you know, it has to be the first step of a longer journey, I think. Mm. Olivia, we appreciate your endeavours, of course. Um, I suppose a lot of people at the moment are feeling fairly disconsolate because they feel that with the government that we've got in England, we're not able to make uh, as much progress as rapidly, perhaps, as they are in, in, in Scotland uh, due to the nature of that particular government. Mm. And, and we feel sometimes that, you know, we might be banging our heads against a wall, which is simply not going to give way or banging on doors that will not be opened because of um, the influence of, of, of some of the, you know, the behind the scenes influence of some of people on, on our government. Their, their voices seem to be louder than ours and that's desperately frustrating. So we do appreciate your endeavors when it comes to trying to fly their flag inside the House of Commons whilst we are waving our banners again, metaphorically outside. Yeah. It's brilliant. And also on mountain hares, for example, you know, I've been asking questions about that as well. It's not just about, you know, it has to be about all the species in our uplands and how we're going to protect them. So, you know, we'll continue as much as I can as the champion um, to do that from a political angle. Fantastic. Olivia, thank you very much yeah, indeed. What, what, what have you got planned for the rest of your day? It's, it's actually, it was it was forecast rain down here in the south of England. Got a bit of sun all of a sudden. And it's now the sun's come out. <laughs> well, it's lovely and cloudy. I think I might actually go out for a walk with my husband a bit later. So we'll probably go up and, and have a walk along the moors and just kind of take it all in. And hopefully we might be able to see some great, um, great birds and um, raptors if we're lucky. Yeah. Um, I heard some curlews the other week, so that was exciting. Yeah. Very good. Fantastic yeah. stuff. Remember, if you spot a hen harrier, you've got to use that uh, uh, tag. <laughs> Henharrier slash rspb.org.uk report all of your sightings. Olivia, thanks very much for Thank joining us. So Keep up much. the good work. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank thanks, you. Olivia. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 God. Bye. It's fantastic, isn't Excellent it? Excellent stuff. Yeah, it's good to have someone on the inside, isn't it? It is. Yeah. You know, exactly. Taking all of these issues really seriously and asking the right questions. That legislation that's been proposed mm -hmm. about burning at the moment is not. Uh, well, I, I won't say it's not worth the paper it's printing on. Uh, that's quite glib. Mm -hmm. uh, but frankly, it's not something which is going to be enforceable uh, in the right way, and it's not going to need to the right changes, and certainly not quick enough. Uh, yeah. We don't have a map of forty. How deep the peat is? No. no who, you what know who's going to go out and measure before they start burning? Oh, they're not. Gonna it's go not going to happen, is it? It? Of course it's Could not. you imagine? It's going a sop. It's just a sop. It's, it's, you know, just... it's like we're doing something, yeah. but we're not doing anything Well, it's meaningful. just to look like you're doing something good, when in reality, nothing's changed. Yeah, it's just exactly. putting on a mask. It's exactly. just absolute rubbish. So we've got to keep anyway. the pressure up. OK, <laughs> the, look, look, OK, let's be positive yeah. about it. Right. Zach and all the other people have been talking about burning. Yes. Ten years ago, it wasn't on their agenda. 15 years ago, they wouldn't have known anything about it at all. Mm -hmm. And 20 years ago, no one was talking about it. So, you know, there is progress. Our, our politicians are talking about it, but what we do need them to do at this critical point is to do something meaningful about it. And quickly. So Olivia is going to be driving that, that which yeah. is really, really good. We're coming towards so the end, actually. We've got a few more things. We've got Jill Lewis coming up. Lewis. You're going to do that interview, that. Yeah, which, we're is, very uh, which is to good. Chatting with Jill. Uh, well, of course, we've been talking about a serious topic, relatively serious topic, of course, with Olivia. Uh, now we want to go back to celebrating our wonderful hen harriers um, and this is a fantastic video we've got coming up for you next um, so finally sharply observed words, words by James MacDonald Lockhart uh, from his raptor book uh, with words and music from Tom Kane as well so enjoy this this is the hen harrier observed this morning the wind has shed some of its weight the curlew's song has more reach a male harrier is coming in from the west, lucent against the heather. He is flying more quickly than usual, keeping a straight line, heading for the nest that sits in the lap of a hill amongst thick tussocks of moor grass. Now the female is up and rising to greet him, brushing towards the male. She is so much larger than him, her colours so markedly different, her tawny browns set against his smoking greyness. For centuries, the male and female hen harrier were thought to be a different species. And this morning, she might have been a larger hawk, about to set upon the smaller male. But, at the last moment, she twists onto her back beneath the male, and their talons 
almost a brush. The male releases something from his feet and she seizes and catches it in mid-air. All of this happens so quickly and the movement is astonishing for its speed and precision. I cannot make out what it is the male has passed to her, but the female has flipped instantly upright again and is rising towards the male once more. It is like an unexpected echo and gives me the chance to replay the whole extraordinary exchange. I stay with the female and watch her drop into the heather, where she begins to feed. Oh. <laughs> Hello, that was fantastic, wasn't it? It was. I was checking something on my phone. <laughs> it was. That sneaked up on us. That yeah, one. no, it was very <laughs> good. good. Be beautiful words. Oh, it's absolutely stunning. You know, it's very poetic and all that beautiful visuals as well. Thank you very, very much to James for that and um, and Tom as well. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's really fantastic. Really good. Hold on. What about? Let's just make sure we can just make sure. Yeah. So hold on. Uh, yes, James MacDonald Luckhart, winner of the World Society of Literature, Jerwood Award for Nonfiction 2011, Authors Foundation Roger Deakin Award in 2011 too. So that was uh, really good. Tom uh, has done the, 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 the voice there. He's an instrumentalist and traditional folk singer. He's a founder member of Off the Wing, which looks at the birds and bird lore of Scotland, which sounds interesting, interesting, as seen through the poetry, literature and traditional music, keeping that culture alive. We like that sort of documentation, of course. And you can find out about his work on his website which is well i think it's probably best to go to the link because it's quite a long yeah, it'll one. be in it'll be in the chat so you can click the link yeah gaelgalproductions.org slash tom kane gail that's and that's g-a-e-l galproductions.org mm -hmm. dot, uh, dot org slash yeah. tom kane and you can find james mcdonald lockhart on twitter at jm lockhart 2 jm lockhart 2 and we'd also like to thank kate berlinson uh, of the authentic authentic artist collective for the introductions mm -hmm. as well so that's fantastic mm -hmm. stuff okay now coming up next i'm very excited that we are joined live by none other than the wonderful jill lewis who's a fantastic children's author she wrote the most amazing book sky, sky dancer. dancer honestly yeah we spoke what to an jill amazing a asset that's been for oh, our calls honestly it's been so so fantastic and so and hello. really generous because she's yes. given us that book and we've sent it out to loads of Lots schools, of schools. And, and it's been a fantastic educational resource a beautiful story beautifully illustrated as well so hello jill Hello, Chris and Megan. It's, um, it's brilliant to be here, actually. Just the whole celebration of the hen harrier. And I think what we've seen today is, yes, we've seen the difficulties the hen harriers had and still having, but I think that ultimate feeling of hope that's really coming through, through awareness and through what people are doing, it feels really special, actually. Yeah, there's a lot of hope, isn't there? And there's a lot of action, lots of things that people can do to take part. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in just a second. But I did want to touch on your Sky Dance a bit quickly because it is just so, so fantastic. So tell us a little bit about kind of the inspiration for that and and, and exactly how important it's been. Well, the Sky Dance was really born out of seeing the hen harrier persecution and the devastation on our grouse moors. And so I did quite a lot of research before I wrote the story. I went up to the grouse moors. Um, I interviewed some gamekeepers, a grouse moor owner, some people living in the area. And I did lots and lots of research and really came to the conclusion that it's unsustainable. Um, driven grouse shooting it is dependent on crime. It is dependent upon the killing of wildlife. Um, and obviously we've got the illegal killing and the legal killing as well. And just these vast, moors of devastate ecological devastation really um, and we're already seeing some of this rewilding coming back we know it can work and so I wanted to write a story about that and I wanted to write it from a child's perspective and I wanted to get three characters who see different perspectives so there's Joe who is the gamekeeper's son who has to make some big decisions 
there is Minty, who's the daughter of a very rich landowner, and she sees, first of all, the perspective of the landowner. And then there's a girl, Ella, who comes up from the city, who, and she's instrumental to changing some of those views. And it's really seeing how Joe changes his perspective to know that the land has to change, but that he can still be a part of it and that there can be um, a vision for a better future, not just for the wildlife and the landscape, but also a much better future for people too, for the people working up in those areas. Absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a very, very beautiful book. I mean, the story is just, you know, phenomenal. So, you know, eloquently put and, you know, as I said, so visual. And you're really keen on promoting those different kind of mediums, whether that's art, writing, poetry, to kind of highlight these issues. I mean, how important is going and touching on these different areas to, to highlight conservation? It's so it's so important. We've just seen that um, those beautiful words, that beautiful video um, just before, just before. And so I think words um, or art is so powerful um, and words are like superpowers. And that's why I love to hear young people's voices as well, because when they have their voice, they can be a really powerful voice. We've seen Sunnyside School. And I mean, how many of us sort of thought, well, where's thistle through listening to them? So I think it is so important, um, the medium of art, because I think you know, science is important and um, it tells us about the world, but art is our emotional connection with the world. And if we can have our emotional connection with the world, then we want to sort of protect it and we want to save it. So certainly really important. Well, this year, again, there is the Young Wild Writer competition, which I'm very excited about because last year we got over 500 entries, which was phenomenal. Um, so tell us a little bit about what the competition is this year and how people can get involved and what they can do to enter. Oh, yes. Well, I'm, we're really excited that this is um, happening again this year. Last year, it was a huge success. We had over 500 entries. And last year, we asked people, children to tell us about their favourite British wildlife. Um, so we heard about newts, the hen harriers, about rock pools and different habitats. And the standard was um, frighteningly very, very high. Um, it made me think, shall I give up writing? Um, <laughs> But it was fantastic. But this year we've got rewilding as a theme. So we want young people to tell us what rewilding means for them. Now it can be rewilding a balcony, rewilding a garden, a park or vast landscapes. It could be on a more abstract theme with when we talk about rewilding, it can be rewilding ourselves or rewilding the community or our families. So we want to ask young people, what does rewilding mean for you? Um, and so the closing date is the 16th of July and there are some fabulous book bundle prizes from some brilliant authors like Piers Torday, um, Nicola Davies, Jackie Morris, Abby Elphinstone, fantastic authors and I'm offering a free, um, a free a Zoom, a prize of a Zoom visit to a school um, to talk about writing. Um, so we're really looking forward to some of these entries coming up. Um, because last year we had, last year's winner was a fabulous poem about um, the hen harrow. I don't know if you remember it from last year, Guardian by Edith Hobson. It was amazing. Yeah, well, it I was do remember it. absolutely it's incredible. It's so, the words for that poem was just absolutely phenomenal. I know, I think you've got a copy of the poem there. So would you like to read it out for us? Because I'd love to hear it again. Uh, it was, a, and Michael Morpurgo wrote it out last, read it out last year. So this is Guardian by Edith Hobson who was aged 10 last year. Guardian, a speck against the sky, frozen, beneath him the moor rolling like a patchwork quilt. Should outstretched wings be mixed with fan tail, be mixed with tumbling acrobatics, you would still be nowhere near the lightning quick swoops and turns of hen harrier's flight. He swoops lower, his fire bright, flame flicker, golden eyes searching, and then a spark of movement, diving, the susurrance of wind through wings, the scream of grouse, a shot rings out, and Hen Harrier climbs, his thoughts thrown deep into time's ocean, where memories drown. Sky dancer, dawn caller, wind whisperer, guardian. For as knots are to tie, as tears are to cry, as wings are to fly, so Hen Harrier is to sky. 
That's um, peaceful, isn't it? it oh, is, it's, just, yeah. it's so moving. It's incredibly powerful. The end what is great amazing well, talent mm. to have at 10 years old. I mean, goodness me. I mean, I, I'd love to see, you know, the poems <laughs> that are coming now this year. I hope there's been many more. But um, yeah, I'm very excited to see those entries coming in. So where exactly do people put their entries to? So, that you know so th there'll be details um, on coming up after and also if, if they look at the hen harrier day website they'll be able to find the details there and go um for the entry details and closing dates and things like that so okay. and we're looking forward to loads of entries hopefully fantastic <laughs> and we'll be announcing the winners on hen harrier day yes which will be at some point in early august of course we normally uh, put it around the inglorious 12th as close to the inglorious 12th the start of the driven grouse shooting yeah. season um so yeah that will be great yeah. So any young people out there, get writing. We can't wait to hear all of your amazing entries coming in. Oh, it's not so young people have got to young get writing. You've got to get writing too. Oh, yes, I Jill, do. Are you, writing. what are you writing at the moment? Um, I'm writing two books at the minute. Um, at the same time? I don't know how you're doing it. I'm ambidextrous. Um, <laughs> Illegally. <laughs> yeah, no, um, exciting things. Once, um, I'm writing about beavers um, and I'm writing about rats. So... There we go. Great. <laughs> Beavers and rats. It's, it's a, ro a, a rodent combo. A rodent double. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. I look forward to seeing, seeing those books come up. But it isn't all about writing, is it? Because there's also another competition for filmmakers, the Young Filmmaker Challenge. So tell us a little bit about that one. Yeah, that's another really exciting competition. So this is for under 30s. And it's a wonderful filmmaking challenge. We saw last year's winner was Lauren Cook cook who we saw the um, video of earlier on which is fantastic and so we're asking under 30 to send in um, a video four minutes or less and again with the theme of rewilding but this year more specifically rewilding the uplands so you don't have to have lots of expensive kit we want to see ingenuity creativity and the ability to really communicate well about an issue um, and again the details are on the hen harrier day website um, and the closing date is the same I believe so we're really looking forward to seeing some fantastic entries um, because again the um, quality was, of entries was so high last year. Yeah they really were they were I seeing all those young filmmakers you know showcase yeah. their incredible skills to tell stories in very different ways which was the exciting thing you know thinking outside of the box often um, it's incredibly impressive so yeah, all these different mediums are really powerful in telling that story so do get your entries into us. Um, and there is, there is a prize as well there's a £250 prize for oh. the filmmakers chance they might buy some new nice new camera quick kit or something like that. Yeah, sounds great. Well, that's a great reason. Shed it, um, shedding yeah. light on hen harriers and, you know, a good prize as well. So great, great reasons to enter there as well. Now, there was another campaign that I have to say when I read about it, I was quite excited. It's kind of about taking action um, and writing into your Often, you know, with campaigns, we ask people to get in contact with their MPs. We just heard from Olivia Blake and all the wonderful things that she's doing to help the environment where she is. Um, but you know, writing into your MPs is really important in a letter form, but you're asking people to do something slightly differently. Absolutely, slightly differently. Um, well, we know that there should be up to sort of 3,000 pairs of hen harries in our skies, and there are only about 600. And the main reason that for that is due to illegal persecution. And that can make you feel, makes me feel quite angry. So, but, you know, rather get angry, we want people to take action and draw their MPs' attention to the plight of the hen harrier, quite literally draw, because sometimes images and what can be much more, more powerful than words. So what we'd like people to do is to have a blank postcard or go to the Hen Harrier Day website and download a template and draw a picture of a Hen Harrier for their MP. Um, it can be a doodle, it can be a very arty piece, anything goes. I've got an example here. So I really love the Hen Harrier eye. Um, so I've drawn a Hen Harrier's eye for my oh. MP. So draw a Hen Harrier. On the other I side, your MP. I quite like that on my wall. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. So find out the name of your um, local MP. Mine is David Warburton, and find their address and write their address on the other side. And then we'd like people to write a polite message to their MP. It can be as simple as "Save our sky dancers." I've written. Dear David Warburton, in this ecological emergency and climate crisis, I ask you to bring an end to driven grouse shooting and restore our uplands to the wild. And then stick a stamp on it. But before you pop it in the post, 
we'd like people to take a photo of their picture and send it to Hen Harrier Action on the Hen Harrier Day website because we want to create a gallery of hen harrier pictures and we'd love to create a gallery of so many hen harriers the number of hen harriers we should be seeing in our skies and create this combined image and again the details are on the hen harrier day website Fantastic. what an amazing thing you know to arrive wow. on the on the doorstep you know loads of pictures of hen harriers i mean it'd be fantastic and very impactful so um, very good please, imaginative you know, polite yeah, peaceful exactly so get drawing get writing get filming lots of things that you can do to help raise awareness for conservation thank you so much joe i'm very aware that you've got two books to write <laughs> so i don't <laughs> want to take too much of your time this afternoon i know how stressful book writing can be <laughs> <laughs> well good luck with your deadlines um and the only other thing we want to say is if anyone would like to volunteer for hen harrier day to offer any ideas for fundraising um, or raising awareness then please do get in contact with hen harrier um, action at hen harrier day website Absolutely. excellent thank you so much joe okay. it's been fantastic to speak to you again um, good yeah. luck writing and i'm sure we'll catch up again very very soon take care <laughs> bye jill see you jill bye bye Mm -hmm. excellent stuff yeah, lovely. lots of things that people can do to get involved there yeah, I like, you know lots I, of creative ways i like the postcard one because it yeah. is, is a passive way of showing your concern for something in a creative way i yeah. like sort of creative demonstrations yeah. shouting about things is you know has its place of course mm -hmm. occasionally but if you can use your imagination to get your point over then i think it's a lot more uh, sometimes a lot more effective Absolutely. well we've just about come to the end actually uh, are we running over i bet we I are, we are yes. yeah we are we're 15 <laughs> minutes over should we just try it's and... not too bad for us actually 15 <laughs> minutes i suppose it's not but <laughs> nevertheless people have got their lunch to have yeah yeah you've got your Sunday we've got, we afternoons. haven't had our breakfast yet no, to be quite honest with you <laughs> about lunch um so basically yes all of that uh, material that you might want to find out about hen harriers i suggest you go to the hen harrier day website sky dancer day uh, website which is uh, available of course orchestrated by hen harrier action lots of good stuff on there um your term to get creative. What about running a hen harrier day? Why not? I mean, people have them all over yep. the UK now. There's no reason why you couldn't organise one for your community to draw attention to the plight of these beautiful birds and and, and spread the word as to why those you know, problems uh, exist and how we can rectify them. Uh, or you could find an event to support. Uh, there will be plenty of hen harrier days running and other events running in the uh, run up to that period in uh, uh, early August. So you could volunteer. Um, and get in, uh, and, and give them some help, which would be great. The competitions we've just heard about from Jill. Yep, Young World Writers, Young Filmmaker Competitions, lots of great things to do, yep. keep you busy. And as Jill said, if you've got any ideas, we're always open to ideas. You can send those to info at henharrierday.uk, info at henharrierday.uk, or of course, as Jill said, you can find out all the details on the Hen Harrier Day uh, website. Um, I'd like to say a massive thanks to all of our contributors yes. who've given their time if not live this morning olivia blake and jill lewis of course were live but all of those others who prepared material in advance um <laughs> so thanks to all of them and of course the hen harrier action team who have put all of this together this morning yeah, done a fantastic job kate cocker who's been behind the scenes helping them out do some stuff today yep. uh, as well and um, basically <laughs> We've got to make a difference. Mm. We are making a difference. We're making significant progress. When you think about, you know, what that we've achieved in just the last, I don't know, even just 10 years, there is a significant difference. Sometimes it does seem like a Sisyphean task. You're pushing that rock uphill. You think you get it at the top, it rolls back down. You've got to start all over again. I'm afraid that's the nature of life. Yeah. Um, you know, and in conservation, things very rarely, unfortunately, happen very quickly. When there are many people involved in any changes in policy, it takes a little while to win them over, win their hearts and minds, or to introduce legislation to put uh, an end. But a lot of people, as you've seen this morning, are out there working really hard to that effect. We're getting there. Yeah. We're every step, you know, no matter how small, it's a step closer. Every Hen Harrier day, it's a step closer to us finally stopping you know, illegal rapture persecution. So, you know, we're getting there, keep up the momentum, keep up, you know, the creativity and, and keep getting involved. You know, we're so grateful to everyone for watching and all those people that are clicking on those links, following those people on social media, donating if they can uh, and getting involved and using their voice because that's the most powerful thing you do, you can do. Every person 
can make a difference. Every voice counts. So please do use your voice um, and get involved in the, con and the conversation and the con conservation. Exactly. Two words. <laughs> and just to wrap it up, of course, one of the most exciting mm. parts of all of those initiatives is the potential of that live webcam. Yes. We've seen that it's out on the hill. We've seen that view of the hill this morning. And if conditions are right weather wise and the birds in, uh, are doing the right thing, uh, then with Brian's guidance, maybe that camera could be on the nest by the end of the week. Keep your eyes peeled for that because it will give us a unique insight into the private life of these fabulous birds. Um, and that will, of course, be on the Hen Harrier Day YouTube channel. Really easy to find. Go on YouTube, type in Hen Harrier Day. Come on. Um, and I, I think nest. many people better. are going to be glued to that when, uh, when that's up and running. So fingers crossed that uh, Andrea and Brian and everyone and the rest of the team can get that working. And I think that's it from us, isn't that's it? Really? it I I, my plan now is scramble tofu late breakfast. Tofu? Yeah. Tofu? What, what did Toti. I? <laughs> scramble tofu. Toffee. Yeah, tofu. Oh, tofu, you, you tof. Um, <laughs> um, and, um, and then it's a Rude. poodle. Uh, look at that. It's a poodle walk because I'm looking over here. You won't see it on the screen. They're fast asleep. But they're, they're sprayed out on the grass. There are two. There are two fluffy poodles that whose walk is so it's about six hours overdue, <laughs> so they are itching to get on their leads. We're in the new forest here, so they're going to be on their leads. Um, mm -hmm. I have to tell you, um, um, but they want to get out, and that's our mission. So thank you very much thank if you've joined us today. Us. Remember, you can catch up with all of this action if you want to again on the YouTube channel. Hats yep. off to all of our contributors. Thank you very much. We'll see you again. Well, we'll be thank certainly you. seeing you for uh, Hen Harrier Day, Day at some point in early August. Until, Until then. then, bye everyone. Goodbye.